Welcome to the India's second Metabolic Health Conference. I'm Dr. Jasmeet, a metabolic health coach and a proud member of D-Life. D-Life, which is India's only award-winning low-carb platform. And I'm honored to be the part of this conference, which has been organized by, by my esteemed mentor, Shashikant Ayangar and Anup Singh, just to bring or to provide you people a scientific feast on the metabolic therapies. And today I have with me Dr. Alex Petrushoes. Dr. Alex, he's a practicing low carb doctor in Sydney, Australia. And along with his wife, Dr. Deepa Mahananda, he runs Sydney Low Carb Specialist, which is a multi multidisciplinary multi, uh, metabolic health clinic. And where they have a team of doctors, dietitians, health coaches, and even exercise physiologists. So Alex is also a foundation member of the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. And he's also one of the directors of the Australian Metabolic Health Society which is a non-profit organization founded in 2023 that is to help or to teach the health practitioners about the metabolic therapies. Alex is so passionate about the preventative health that he incorporates improving the lifestyle changes in the patients to improve their chronic diseases, even without the medications, if possible. So prior to his work in the low-carb space, he worked as an oncology trainer for several years and maintains an active interest in the cancer. So welcome again, Do uh, Dr. Alex, to the fir India's first platform for the Metabolic Health Conference. Thanks for having me again, Jasmine. Good to be here. Yeah, Dr. Alex, you were there in the earlier conference as well. So this is the second one. So welcome. Thank you for having me. So, uh, Dr. Alex, I have seen like, you know, uh, you people, Dr. Deepa and you, you both, you cover a wide range of metabolic health issues and you use the metabolic therapies for their treatment. Can you please talk about how your clinical practice has evolved, evolved over time? Yeah, sure. So as you mentioned, you know, early on in my career, I did several years of oncology training as a radiation oncologist. So that was really looking at cancer from the other end of the spectrum. So no prevention. It was too late by then. But, you know, treating patients who are often very sick um, with radiotherapy and other standard cancer therapies. Um after several years, I actually changed careers and went into general practice because I wanted more variety in my practice. And I did that basically at the same time as my wife, Dr. Deepa, you mentioned. So when we got into general practice, it's a bit different from hospital practice. So patients on a whole are not acutely sick, typically, um, but you are then also struck with a, a tidal wave of chronic illness. So all the diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, dementia, all of these things that uh, the, is usually the realm of the GP we were seeing. And we're seeing all these people, we were following all the standard treatment guidelines and a lot of patients were just not getting better. They were getting put on escalating doses of medications and there was a lot of polypharmacy and just everyone was not really getting better. So that was what prompted Deepa and myself to really pursue other therapies was not out of any particular ideology, just out of necessity to try and find something for these patients. So that's where we stumbled on low carb and ketogenic therapies. And really in the last six or seven years, that's where our practices has really taken off. So that included starting our own low carb clinic and building a team around us to help us manage patients. Um, and so along the way, it wasn't actually at the start, but along the way, this idea of using um, metabolic therapies for cancer and this notion that cancer is a metabolic disease came up. And with my, you know, my, with my background in cancer, there was something that came to me quite naturally because I could understand cancer biology um, relatively well, having had um, studied some of it in the past. So, so that is over the last two or three years, we've, we've built up a patient population of um, people with cancer who are either going through active treatment or they've been through treatment um, or they've got no other treatment options who are looking to, to pursue ketogenic therapies and other metabolic therapies to help with their cancer. So that's that's really how our practice has evolved over the years. Yeah, uh, so Dr. Alex, we will come to the metabolic therapies for the cancer, but it would be great if we can start the, uh, just with a definition, like what cancer cells are and how they are different from the normal cells. Yeah, sure. So uh, cancer is really a, 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 dis a disorder of um, abnormal cell growth and invasion. Um, and so the in the past, there have been several hallmarks of cancer that have been described. Um, so we describe every cancer based on its tissue of origin normally. So we'd say it's a lung cancer, or it's a prostate cancer, or it's a breast cancer. And normally we divide down 
um, subtypes of cancer based on the, the particular cell line. So it could be an adenocarcinoma or a squamous cell carcinoma or a melanoma or whatever it might be. But whatever kind of cancer it is, they tend to all follow these same hallmarks. So that includes replicative immortality. In other words, the cancer cell can divide indefinitely. Um, it includes uh, invasion and metastasis, which is one of the more um, concerning aspects of cancer. So cancer cells can spread to other organs or foreign distant organs. Resisting cell death, uh, sustained proliferative signaling. These are all classical hallmarks of cancer that have been well described for 20 or 30 years. Uh, and basically every cancer will follow these exact same patterns. But um, over time, the hallmarks of cancer have expanded. And one of the newer criteria that is, is being increasingly mm -hmm. acknowledged is this idea of dysregulated or deregulated cellular metabolism, which is really mm -hmm. aiming to, to, to really quantify that um, the, the cancer cell accesses energy in a way that is fundamentally abnormal. And this has really been described well back since the 1940s and 50s by Otto Warburg, who was a German physician who um, correctly described that cancer cells um, predominantly ferment for their energy. So whether that's glucose or sometimes lactate, uh, they will ferment the uh, fuel for energy, uh, whether there's oxygen there or not. And that's quite different to, to normal cells. So in our body, outside of red blood cells, uh, most of our cells are typically gaining energy from a process called oxidative phosphorylation. Mm -hmm. So that involves the mitochondria, and as the name implies, it involves oxygen. So um, with one molecule of oxygen and glucose, we end up with 36 molecules of ATP out of that. So that's that's yeah. our fundamental energy source. So that's actually quite a efficient way to get energy. So 36 molecules of ATP is pretty good um, outcome. In anaerobic situations, and most 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 people listening will, will understand what that is if they've gone for a sprint and there's not enough oxygen getting to the muscles, um, the muscles will also ferment yeah. um, either glucose or lactate. So they will use that for energy if they must when there's not enough oxygen around. But to do this, you only get two molecules of ATP. So it's not a particularly efficient way to get ATP. It has the advantage of not being oxygen um, dependent. And it has the advantage of you uh, being a quicker way to get energy. So it, you actually get the energy much quicker. So for a cell that needs it here and now, um, it can be quite effective. But unfortunately, that process is not going to be enough to sustain our whole body. And there's a really easy way to tell whether that's going to be the case. And because we can give um, we can give a rat or an animal cyanide, which basically blocks oxidative phosphorylation yeah. and that rapidly causes um, death of any organism, in essence, because you're turning off oxidative phosphorylation. So now, if we... Uh, sorry? So it's like if we give a people a cyanide, so yep. all of their cells will die and just the cancer cells will still survive. For a short period of time, yes. But within a dead host, they can't survive very long. But you're correct. So if we give cyanide to too many cell lines in a lab, um, they're not that fast because they're not oxygen dependent necessarily. As long as they've got available substrate of fermentable um, material, then they can access their energy. Um, so, so in that way, um, cancer cells' fuel source is, is different from most um, normal cells. Now, a couple of decades later on, um, the work of Thomas Seyfried, who I know you've had speak at this conference yeah. this weekend, um, has really identified that not only is abnormal fermentation issue, but the fundamental driver of this abnormal energy uh, behavior is that the mitochondria in the cancer cell yeah. is abnormal, is not functioning well. So, so with oxidative phosphorylation, we do need healthy mitochondria to get the job done, whereas with fermentation, we don't necessarily. Um, so, uh, so the, do you think? So, uh, Alex, do you think it could be an adapt adaptive mechanism, like inside of a body, that the cells? They just want to survive and then they follow this inefficient pathway of the metabolism to survive and further to grow as well. It's like that, something, that, some triggers must be there. Yeah, so that that is, a, I think, a very good working theory for what's going on. So a healthy cell is not going to start engaging in this behavior out of the yeah. blue. So as you say, it's very likely an adaptive stress response where a cell is saying, well, I'd rather do this inefficient um method of of energy um, production uh, rather than dying but mm -hmm. over time that's going to increase potentially stress within the cell and if you have a cell that's chronically stressed and that's when things can break down so so the prevailing 
theory or the prevailing way of thinking about cancer in most modern medical circles is to think of it as a genetic disease because we can pinpoint that most cancers have many predictable or varied uh, gene mutations, whether it's P53 or KRAS or any other gene mutations. And if we take a biopsy of a cancer, there'll invariably be some abnormal mutations. Uh, the problem is they are down the track. They're not the primary driver of, of the pathology. So they come later as a response to this chronic energy dysfunction. So, so yes, there are, there are many pathways to metabolic dysfunction that can cause cancer, and we see this in epidemiology. So common carcinogens, so chemical carcinogens like cigarette smoke, um, asbestos, alcohol, they all are chemical toxins. We can have... So what does these carcinogens do in our body? Like they are there to our... They disrupt our mitochondria health? Correct, yes. Yeah. So they are often described in terms of their gene mutation potential. Um, but again, the core driver is metabolic, uh, metabolic and mitochondrial dysfunction. So there aren't really any carcinogens or any um, factors that drive up in a risk of cancer that are not linked to metabolic or mitochondrial dysfunction. So we've got several viruses that are, are known to induce cancers in susceptible people. We've got uh, other metabolic factors like hyperglycemia or hyperinsulinemia, which will drive increased risk of cancer. Um, even things like cortisol might potentially if, through an indirect um, route. So, so that all of these factors, they are all going through a, a, a root um, uh, cause, which is the mitochondrial dysfunction. And that is what drives everything. Yeah, so carcinogens could lead to the mitochondrial dysfunction, but do you think that the underlying health conditions does matter because, you know, the people who are exposed to the carcinogens, not everybody get cancer. Correct. Yeah. So I think to a degree, your genetics do play a bit of a role, but it, again, in what way they play a role is probably down to how metabolically healthy your mitochondria are. So yes, a perfectly healthy mitochondria is not going to get um, you know, an Epstein-Barr infection or not going to be exposed to one cigarette and suddenly turn into a, a cancer yeah. cell. So um, it is really death by a thousand cuts. And if you have a cell that's chronically dysfunctional, then that's when it's more at risk of being tipped over the edge um, into carcinogenesis. So let's come to the mitochondrial health. You know, how one can improve their mitochondrial health? And what are the other health conditions or the metabolic disorders, like how they impact our mitochondrial health? Yeah, so that's that's quite a complex um, question in many ways. And unfortunately, as a clinician, we don't really have good ways of measuring what's happening at the mitochondria um, at a subcellular level. But if we think about what our mitochondria need to be happy, they need um, good energy balance. So we want... Um, appropriate energy partitioning. We want an absence of chronic inflammation because chronic inflammation is, again, one of those things that can cause dysfunction of um, metabolic health and mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, and we need appropriate nutrients. So we know there's many cofactors um, that play a role with mitochondrial function. But so when we talk about the diabetes, in case of the diabetic people, they have really, very really high blood sugar numbers, you know, but like uh, there are, there is glucose, there is a fuel which is available in their blood, but still the mitochondria is not able to use it. It could be due to the mitochondrial dysfunction. It could be due to the insulin resistance. So, but the mitochondria is, the cells are really starving. So it means the diabetes is one of the prominent factor that could lead to right. like... Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, that, that appropriate energy partitioning is a major driver of mitochondrial dysfunction. So... Um, absolutely. So we need good insulin signaling to make sure that glucose can enter the mitochondria or in, into the cell if it needs to. And if it can't enter, as you say, because it's building up in the blood because the insulin signaling is abnormal, then we're going to run into problems. Now, one of the things you sort of see with mitochondrial health is a healthy mitochondria doesn't seem to be as fast about whether it's using glucose or yeah. ketones. So fuel, yeah. Whereas a stressed mitochondria or a dysfunctional mitochondria strongly is going to favor ketones or it's going to work much better when there are ketones. And you can see this with Alzheimer's, you can see this with diabetes clearly and um, and other neurological disorders as well, such as epilepsy. So so in that on that front, ketones uh, offer us a, a very advantageous way to access ATP from the mitochondria if the mitochondria is stressed 
or dysfunction. Okay, uh, so you mean like using ketones instead of glucose is the more efficient way to get energy? Correct, yeah. In, in simple terms, yes. So someone who's got perfectly healthy mitochondria is very likely to be able to access energy from either glucose or ketones. So, yeah. you know, average toddler is, is so going to have no problem with accessing energy from either. It's about whatever fuel is available. Correct, yeah. So the easiest fuel we can access for a stress mitochondria is ketones. And that really dovetails well into the cancer discussion because to use ketones for fuel, we do need those mitochondria working. And we know cancer cells have um, mitochondria that are not functional. So um, in, in many ways, ketones are not a very good fuel for cancer cells or they're not a fuel source that cancer cells can use appropriately. So, so the thinking behind the, the metabolic uh, theory of cancer is why don't we leverage this to our advantage. So we'll really um, focus on a fuel source that our body will happily use, um, but our cancer cells cannot use. And then with we'll, whatever you know, small amount of glucose is left in the body, then our normal cells will, again, they'll happily use that, but they're competing against a cancer cell that is very hungry or very addicted to that glucose. Okay, so before we get into this, it's better that we can start with what are the fuels on which the cancer cells can actually survive and grow? Yeah, so they are they are fermenting. The primary fuel source for, for fermentation in the cancer cell is going to be glucose. So that's far and away the most important one. They do have access to some amino acids they can use for fermentation. The most um, important one is an amino acid called glutamine, which is the most commonly circulating amino acid in the blood. So, so that, that provides an important backdoor for um, the cancer cell to get access to energy, unfortunately. Um, there is some evidence that certain cancer cells can um, can use arginine, which is another amino acid for fuels. Yes. And there is um, some fermentation with lactate as well, but that's less, con less common and less relevant. Okay, so glucose, lactate, arginine, and glutamine. So uh, with the help of the metabolic therapies, we will go one by one. Okay, let's start with the glucose. Uh, how using the metabolic therapies, you suppress the glucose levels to starve or maybe so that the cancer cells become more weaker and weaker. So what are the therapies that you use? So the, the strongest therapy we can use, and it always is the strongest therapy, is diet. So a ketogenic diet is the best way to limit circulating glucose as much as you can and increase circulating ketone bodies as much as you can. So this has been around for you know, over a century now. Uh, and is really the the best way of controlling cancer from a sugar's perspective. And when we talk about ketogenic diet for cancer, we're really talking about quite a strict therapeutic ketogenic diet or a, a traditional ketogenic diet, if you will. So we're talking about usually three to one ratio of protein to fat. So it's very high um, uh, fat content, usually 70 to 80% of our calories from fat quite a moderate um, protein intake. So we don't actually want protein intake to be too high and then generally carbohydrates as low as possible. So for many conditions in our clinic, such as diabetes or obesity or um, you know, certain other conditions, we tell patients, you don't have to chase ketones. The ketones yeah. are just part of the process. But for cancer, this is one of those um, rare situations where we really are chasing ketones. We want them to be as high as possible. Because and you just want to make sure that the, all the rest of the body is using the ketones. Right. And the cancer cells are the one because they can't use ketones for the fermentation and they are just relying on the glucose levels. So it's right. very important to make sure that the body is running, uh, is in nutritional ketosis. Yes, in therapeutic nutritional ketosis, yes. So, And the way we measure this with patients is with um, blood glucose and blood ketone measurements. Okay. And we, we use a marker called the GKI, the glucose yeah. ketone index, which is very simply your blood glucose divided by your blood ketones. So mm -hmm. in that regard, we're really wanting to leverage the sugar as low as possible and get the ketones as high as possible to, to really spread that gap. So what out. are the numbers you look for then for the GKI, the, the glucose to ketone index? So typically GKI under two is where we'd like it to be. Um, basically as low as you can get it. Now, if you think about a GKI of two, then say your blood sugar is four and it's probably not going to fall, fall much less than four, that means your ketones need to be at least two. So um, 
from simple mathematic perspective, your your blood ketones are really going to be the biggest determinant of what your GKI is because your blood sugar won't change that much. Um, so how low how low you get the blood sugar uh, for the cancer patients? Um, it runs a little bit different, but typically, you know, between four to four point five is where most patients will get them. Four Some patients will go lower. Mm mole per millimole. Yep, yeah, millimoles per liter. Um, some patients will go lower, but often your the body just will not tolerate it going any lower than that unless it's during fast, potentially. So the ketones, we'd like to get them as high as possible, so typically above two millimoles if we can. Okay. Uh, so the first thing that you target is the glucose. And the other one is, as I mentioned, is a glutamine. Glutamine, no doubt that you're also restricting the protein intake because, but Glutamine is a non-essential in the sense that body in itself can produce and it's, I think, one of the abundance amino acid which is produced in our body. So uh, do you target both of these uh, fuels uh, at the same time or you first uh, get the person into the ketosis and then you get uh, to the glutamine? Yeah, that's a good question. So normally we focus on glucose first because that's the, the first order priority. And realistically, if a patient can't get the GKI right, then it's probably yeah. not that relevant to talk about the glutamine, right? So we talk about the glucose as the front door and the glutamine is the back door. There's no point addressing the back door if the front door is wide open. So okay. we normally do glucose first. Um, fortunately, with glucose, the diet plays a big role. But unfortunately, with, with glutamine, we don't have many good dietary options because as you say it's a non-conditional non-conditional essential um amino acid and diet doesn't seem to play a big role there so we don't have many good dietary levers on the glutamine and in fact we don't have a huge amount of drugs we can use either so with glucose we do have some drugs we can use but um with with glutamine it's not so easy so Back in the 1950s, there was some um, research with uh, certain glutamine blocking drugs, and the most common one is something called Eldon, which which has been used for for cancer in the past. Um, so that's six diazo, five oxo, L norleucine. That's Eldon. Um, it, it, it did show anti cancer effects in vitro, but uh, the problem is it's highly toxic because unlike uh, glucose, our our normal cells they need access to glutamine. Yeah. So, so significant glutamine blockage is actually quite toxic to the gut and the immune system, a few other things like that. So it, we, it's not as easy as glucose. We can't just deprive the body completely of glutamine. Um, and I know there are some studies and some labs using uh, Eldon at a lower dose to see whether maybe it can be useful when combined with a ketogenic diet. But I practice in Australia and we don't have access to any Eldon here. So we have to get creative and look at other potential options for, for addressing glutamine. But I think you um, mentioned that there are sub, some supplements that can also suppress the glutamine or maybe the glutamine uptake in the body. Like Yeah, so so this is probably a good time to dovetail into talking about repurposed drugs, I guess. So so if we're um, if we're pursuing a metabolic therapy for patients with cancer, then there are some other drugs we can use that help things along. In of themselves, they're not going to cure cancer, but they do potentially have advantageous effects. So one of the most common ones we will use is a drug called metformin, which is commonly used for diabetes, and a lot of people would know what that is. Why, so, why you use metformin? To prevent the gluconeogenesis? So metformin works on both the glucose and the glutamine front. So it appears mm -hmm. to inhibit glutamine um, uptake as well. So it works on that and it works on reducing circulating glucose and as you say, inhibiting gluconeogenesis. So metformin is a drug that, that sort of covers both bases and it's cheap, it's well tolerated by the vast majority of patients. Um, and if you look at the clinical data, so not even by people thinking about cancer from a metabolic perspective, but if you look at um, clinical data, patients on metformin with a whole variety of different cancers are more likely to live longer or survive that cancer. So to me, using metformin in this way is a no-brainer. Um, you know, whether it's brain tumor, sure. lung cancer, breast cancer, it's uh, increasing the odds of survival and it's also just pushing things in the right direction. So do you mean that the taking even a metformin for a normal person like uh, who's not a cancer patient like it's not a good idea because you said that it uh, suppresses the glutamine uptake as well. Yeah. But glutamine is essential for our immune system, our for our gut health. 
So Correct. does it mean that uh, uh, mitochondria? High potent gluten, glutamine inhibitor. So it's not anywhere near as potent as Eldon, but it's a it's a weak glutamine inhibitor. So, oh. but people are consuming point. metformin for years and years. Yep. That's why we see like you know people really destroy their gut with metformin, and then they start oh. taking then they start taking glutamine supplements. You know, glutamine supplements yes. they are very common nowadays. Yeah, and they can be useful for gastro or for repairing gut gut microbiome and things like that. But um, you know, during a metabolic um therapy for cancer, we'd be a bit nervous about using high doses of glutamine. But yeah, anyway, metformin is one of those drugs that has well established um benefits. They are mild, but they are there for for cancer. So yeah. one of those drugs that we find very easy to recommend for for patients who are undergoing metabolic therapy for cancer. One of the other drugs or supplements we would use for glutamine inhibition is EGCG, um, which is a compound found in green tea extract. So it has in vitro activity against glutamine as well. And again, it's going to it's going to be a weak glutamine inhibitor, but it has that effect. So because we don't have many options for glutamine inhibition, um, it's something that's easy to recommend as a fairly cheap, non-toxic um, uh, supplement that patients can use. The only downside of EGCG is it does potentially interact with certain chemotherapies. So we tell patients to just make sure that the oncologist is happy for them to be on it uh, if they're having chemotherapy. Okay. But how long do you provide these supplements that suppress the uptake of glutamine? Because uh, are they just suppressing the uptake or they're also like, you know, the suppressing the production of glutamine in the body? So the studies are done, a lot of the studies are done on, you know, in vitro assays. So there's the pressing glutamine uptake in cells. Okay. So but how long we can give to the cancer patients all these supplements, you know, as glutamine is essential for many in our body? Yeah. I don't think there's any clear answer on that. So a lot of these metabolic oh. therapies, we don't have a lot of long-term data. So... Um, I, I would say if a patient is, is undergoing metabolic therapy, typically when they see me, they've either got stage four cancer or they've got a glioma or they're in a situation where there aren't many easy or good standard therapies. So in that instance, we typically say if things are working, so if your pro, you know, progress imaging is looking good, tumor is shrinking, then we're not going to change anything. We're going to keep going. And if things are not looking well, then we might say, look, you know, this, treat, this, this treatment strategy is not working. So in that case, you know, you might not need to take it anymore. So at the moment, we're still working within a framework of limited evidence or not enough evidence. We'd always want more evidence, but it's one of those areas that's quite hard to convince people to study. So people like Thomas Seyfried have been trying to get clinical studies um, uh, approved for some time. And there are some coming, but there's not enough. It's it's much easier to get an oncology trial off the ground if there's a pharmacotherapy involved or if there's money to be made from um, a new drug. So that's, and unfortunately, that's just how it is. Okay, that's great. Uh, so Alex, in your clinical practice, you are dealing with some cancer patients, as you mentioned, like, uh, in collaboration with oncologists. So is it like uh, the both of these treatments go in parallel, like you are giving the metabolic therapies and at the same time maybe they, taking some radiation therapy or the chemotherapy? Correct, yes. Yeah. So in my practice, I, I know there are some clinics out there in other countries who are using Eldon and metabolic therapies alone without any standard therapies, but in our clinic, we we aim to work alongside the patient's oncologist. So everything, and that's the beauty of metabolic therapy, is everything we do works in parallel and you could argue in conjunction with standard treatments, whether it's surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, immunotherapy, um, hormone therapy, all the standard treatments. So so absolutely, we work with patients who and with their oncologist to, to be doing everything at the same time. And I think thinking about treatments against cancer in that way is, is quite advantageous. So this idea that we're going to hit a cancer from every angle possible, um, if we can, um, I, I think that's quite appealing. So there was a time when we were thinking about using, you know, targeted agents or very narrow focused drugs to kill cancers. And that just hasn't worked because all you need is one cancer cell to be resistant to this one therapy. And then all of a sudden you've bred a new resistant cancer um, cell line. So um, cancers do need to be attacked from several different angles. Mm -hmm. And metabolic therapies really work well for that because they're non-toxic, they're generally well-tolerated, and they have other health benefits anyway. So 
So absolutely, we combine um, treatments with the patient's uh, standard uh, regimen. So uh, do you think, I just want to ask, like, uh, what are your thoughts, like, for a cancer patient, does the met metabolic therapy should be the frontline treatment? And if needed, the conventional treatment can be associated with this? Um, I, I think it's very reasonable to offer it as an option for patients. Um, I, I tell all of my patients that see me who want to talk about metabolic therapy for cancer that this is not an accepted gold standard of treatment yet. Uh, and there's not enough evidence there to suggest that a ketogenic diet is necessarily going to cure cancer for lots of people. I think it's an important adjuvant treatment to be added in alongside everything else. So I tell my patients typically that whether it's surgery or chemotherapy or whatever it is, to, to incorporate that alongside um, metabolic therapy. Now, again, I... In the sense, like, uh, does it make... Uh, the chemotherapy or the other therapy more effective? Well, that's the thinking. So there is some evidence that combining it is well tolerated and increases um, success rates. So I think that's that's the angle that we would take. So there's no real studies comparing standard of care and metabolic therapy. And to be honest, I don't think we need to do that because they can be done together. They're not mutually exclusive. Because as I have heard Dr. Thomas say it, because he was saying like if you, we really start to look the cancer as a metabolic dysfunction, you know there will be complete change in the treatment. The paradigm, whole paradigm, can change. Yep, and that's what makes this a very disruptive, you know, almost like disruptive technology. You know, it is quite um, a, a big change in how you think about it. So you know, most of my most of the oncologists that I work with have no idea about what the Warburg effect really is. I didn't learn it at all during my training. So um, it is a very different way of looking at cancer. But I, I think the glutamine issue is what gives me a little pause. So if we have a good, elegant way of blocking glutamine in cancer cells, then I think, I think I'd have a lot more confidence. As it stands, it's not quite clear to me that a ketogenic diet alone is going to be enough to cure a cancer once it's established. It's just and like are, we are putting some kind of stressors with the metabolic therapies on the cancer cells. And right. when they go for the therapies and, you know, the cancer cells are already, um, they are already weak and they don't have enough energy, you know, to yep. prevent from the radiation therapy. So it's easy to kill them. Mm. Yep, correct. So that that's the idea of combining things. So often what we will say to patients is we'll do the press pulse in terms of, you know, we'll, we'll do ketogenic diet as the press constantly. And then pulse will be something like chemotherapy. So say a patient has chemotherapy once mm -hmm. every three weeks, then um, before their chemotherapy, we may want to add in a fast. And fasting is another yes. tool we can use that's a very mm -hmm. potent metabolic um, treatment. Because if we put a patient on a fast for 48 hours or 72 hours before their treatment, then by the time the by the time the chemotherapy is going through the vein, then glucose is as low as it's going to get. Ketones are typically as high as they're going to get. So the cancer cell is maximally stressed from a dietary point of view. And then if you've got a cancer cell that's already weakened, then that chemotherapy may work stronger then. So again, yeah. this is the very additive synergistic treatments, they work together in that regard. And the same can be said for other yeah. Uh, holistic or other alternative treatments such as hyperbaric oxygen or um, hyperthermia. So these are also hormetic stresses on the body. And if we combine them all together, we may we may end up with a more successful treatment. And again, there's limited evidence on how all of these things interact and whether they are truly synergistic together. But there are case reports um, of patients with metastatic cancer going to remission following similar protocols of ketogenic diet, um, fasting prior to chemotherapy and using hormetic uh, treatments such as hyperbaric oxygen and hypothermia. Yeah, but the foundation is a diet. And then later on, we can add on the another therapies, as you mentioned, the hyperbaric oxygen therapy or hyperthermia to put the extra stressors on the cancer cells. Correct. Yeah, correct. I think um, if you're from a metabolic perspective, if you can't get the diet right, then it's a bit hard to see how all of the other things are going to have a major effect. I think the diet is such a 
potent metabolic intervention that it's it's likely to to be the main driver of certainly the glucose side of things. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Dr. Alex. So I think now I can invite uh, Shashikant Anger and Anup Singh. And I think sure. if we have a few questions from the uh, public, we can ask, uh, because we have time. We still have 10 minutes. You still have 10 minutes, Jasmith. You can take up the questions. Yeah, better. Okay. I don't see it here. Like if we have any on YouTube, let me just see on the YouTube. In fact, there is also uh, one question which has come out is the, the, the correlation of the seed oils with cancer. How far is it true? Because there has been some discussion in the social media on this. Um, yeah, I must say I haven't looked too much into that, but seed oils, they, are, um, they cause metabolic dysfunction. So anything that causes metabolic dysfunction should, should in theory increase your risk of cancer because it's a mitochondrial stressor to not have access to appropriate energy and to not have healthy energy partitioning. So yes, um, seed oils are likely to cause a problem, whether it's indirect via their increased risk of diabetes or you know obesity or insulin resistance, or whether it's another direct means, I'm, I'm not quite sure on that. One thing that's probably relevant for a lot of people um, uh, in India who are using seed oils is when you fry them, there are some volatile compounds that come out of the, the seed oil under heat. So anyone who's gone to medical school knows the classic lung cancer patient who's a non-smoker is an Asian female. And one of the reasons is they're most likely frying a lot of seed oils. If you look at, um, if you look seed at these oil, Isn't that the seed oils, they are in itself inflammatory? They are in themselves inflammatory, but when you heat them to high heat at their smoke point, they release volatile compounds that you are going to breathe into your lungs. And so, so it's very likely that one of the, the ways that you can induce a lung cancer from that in someone who's susceptible is through inhaling these volatile compounds. Yeah, you know, I would like to share one of the incident, you know, uh, I was invited in the World Cancer Care Organization, which is a global organization. It, uh, they are dedicated to raise awareness about cancer. I was invited in a camp and uh, suddenly when I just get to the uh, section where they were just checking the blood sugar levels for the public who are visiting just for the checkup. So I see like the glucometer number, it was showing something around 400, you know. The clinician who was present there, to my surprise, what he said is, he said, nothing wrong with you. What you have to do is just try to avoid a little bit of sugar. And I think you had your breakfast. That's why it's that high. So I got very aggressive. So I thought I am here. I don't know why they have invited me. So I just went to the organizers and asked them. So then they asked me to give the public. Uh, there was a media person and he asked me to just give a pub bite to the media. Like they are doing very good work and all other things. So in front of the media only I said, like these people are raising awareness. That's a great thing. But the one thing first, they should be aware about the facts. Because the number 400, that is the critical number and need to be addressed. And all these metabolic disorders and diabetes, which is one of the major factors that can trigger cancer, it leads to the mitochondrial dysfunction. You know, I don't know, the people are really not aware about this and they are organizing camps, almost 20 camps in a month in the various part of India. You know, that's why such kind of conferences, such kind of sessions need to be done so that the people should get aware at least the organizations which are participating to raise the awareness. Yeah, it's a huge blind spot with these organizations. When even if you don't understand the mitochondrial aspect of cancer, just epidemiology shows that if you're a diabetic, your risk of cancer is doubled. Yeah. So how many diabetics there would be in India? You just think of how many extra cancers that adds into the health system. It's huge. So I think if we just want to think about not getting cancer, then our priorities are don't ingest carcinogens, so don't smoke, don't drink to excess, don't um, have exposure to asbestos, and then don't be metabolically unhealthy, so don't have diabetes or insulin resistance. If we can achieve those those two things, then you know the rate of cancer in the community is going to be significantly lower. Yeah. There's one more question in the front end in the YouTube that. Uh, 
meat causes cancer the position of who meat causes colon cancer especially so they wanted some clarity you may have discussed this but again this is a question that has just come up yeah sure so um yeah that's a it's a a well worn um position statement now it's been around for a while um there's no convincing evidence that red meat causes cancer that's that's the simple summary um when you look at the data that's been used to blame red meat it is it's consistently low quality and it's consistently based on nutritional epidemiology and consistently when we look at higher quality data or when the data is filtered to for higher quality or newer studies there is no relationship at all nor should there be so red meat doesn't really make it into the colon it's absorbed up, higher up in the gut so um there's many reasons for why it shouldn't even be biologically plausible the only caveat there is um if we are charring our meat or eating a lot of blackened meat then that might be a problem but the the studies they use to criticize red meat um or some of the uh, potential mechanisms they use to criticize meat red meat chicken is an issue on that front as well you know chicken's got heterocy heterocyclic amines in it um but it's not associated with increased risk of bowel cancer um chicken can char and brown just like red meat can too and again it's there's no association with um bowel cancer even some of the lab studies that are done at the who report quotes the lab researchers they they do these studies and they actually found that chicken caused um some abnormalities in the 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 rat guts as well but they just try and explain it away because it's inconvenient to talk about it and and these rat studies they are incredibly flawed to begin with because what they do is they give these rats carcinogenic compounds and they give them a diet that's designed to be in essence pro carcinogenic and then see what happens so it's a very artificial um a very artificial situation and you understand why you can't have 20,000 rats living a healthy life and then um monitor how many cancers they get it's hard to study carcinogenesis but the long and short of it is that um even if you took that data as you know real data um the the relative risks they're talking about in these studies are minimal they're very small to begin with um and there's no there's no way of accounting for healthy user bias so i imagine it's the same in india as in australia red meat is criticized for 50 years so therefore health conscious people don't eat it because they think it's it's not healthy and therefore health conscious people tend to be healthier and um however when you look at a country like say or a place like hong kong red meat is not vilified in hong kong it's a sign of wealth people really prize red meat in uh, hong kong when you look at people in hong kong there's no association with red meat and cancer because the healthy people in hong kong or the health conscious people they still eat red meat what about the position of the the, the processed meat they say that it adds nitrate or nitrite will it have any adverse effect maybe sausages uh, and all which is cured meat or something yeah the the effect again is actually quite minimal so i i tend to not favor cured meat for patients simply put because it's simply because um you know it's not as nutritious but there's no specific need to to avoid cured meat and you know, our ancestors have eaten it for for thousands of years um the the nitrate compounds our body uses those compounds there is exposed to those compounds whether we like it or not it's in celery it's in lots of plant foods as well so um again very unconvincing when you look at the the data on that fine fine and i think who also it is it is they also say that it, it they consider as a probability that you know it might cause cancer it is it is not the surety i mean it is not in that in that that sure character that's how it is fine anyway we are coming to, to end end of the session uh, i'll request to get anup singh also inside anup you are there fine till till he comes uh, dr alex thank you very much and uh, you have come again for the session uh, please get anup in so for the second metabolic health conference and since this conference was dedicated to the metabolic therapy specifically in cancer ckd neurological mental health and we thought you know since you have a significant experience in this field that you should come again and speak to us and thank you very much and um, jasmeet as usual you have hosted very well and uh, i think we'll take a we'll get a very good take a message from sessions thank you 
Anup, thank you, God. thank you, Doctor Aglex, for coming again. This is your second appearance with us, and I'm sure there'll be many more going forward. So no thank, worries, you, thank you, thank you for thank you for accepting our invitation and sparing time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good luck for the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much, Doctor Alex.